Welcome to the 60th episode of the Reading and Writing Podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Rutherford. Stay tuned for my interview with Christopher Bolin, author of the novel, Lightning People. Well, welcome back to the Reading and Writing Podcast. My guest today is Christopher Bolin. Bolin's first novel, Lightning People, was recently published by Soft Skull Press. Chris, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Very happy to be here. Sure. First, I wanted to see if you could read the first three or four paragraphs of your debut novel, Lightning People. We had lightning strikes all summer, but no blackouts. Through May and June, lightning came without rain, rising out of New Jersey like a laser concert and slicing east and white tracers through Manhattan. Storms were a huge attraction for those of us who moved here from the Midwest. We climb up to the rooftops as ritual to watch them roll in from the west, feeling momentarily connected to the cereal grain prairies and humid river valleys that we had worked so desperately to escape. For a long time, we did this without worry or risk. After all, in the years when we were so new to the city, rooftops served as our 24-hour parks. They were our unpoliced drug lairs, our water tower jungle gyms, our love nests for random hookups with enough of a romantic panorama not to feel ashamed when groping through underwear near a bed of moldering trash. Every building had one, junked with cables and rusted lawn furniture and billion-dollar views. For many years, we were drunk and happy, loitering on these hot tar gardens, adding our slender bodies to the skyline. The storms, however, were different. They were a private matter, a religion best observed alone, and maybe only for the Midwesterners, because they were the ones who were killed. First it happened to a 23-year-old from St. Louis on a rooftop on Broom Street, then to a 27-year-old from Indiana on a six-floor tenement on the Lower East Side. Another lightning death occurred a few weeks later, also to a Midwesterner. The victims were all young men and women who had moved to the city within the last few years, scrounging for jobs or fame, and they had all been struck by a single bolt that ripped the shoes off their feet and melted the coins in their pocket. Although the newspapers never bothered to draw more than a cursory connection, each victim was described as happy or ambitious or starting to make a real home in New York. I don't know why the weather would take her, one grieving mother was quoted as saying. You expect murders or burglaries, but you don't think your daughter is going to be killed by lightning in the middle of Manhattan. It makes no sense. Most people will tell you that such deaths don't make sense. Lightning strikes contain all of the inexplicable characteristics of coincidence. No reason, just a dice roll. Like a tornado rummaging through one house and leaving the next unbothered. Then there are tougher cynics like Dell, who says that because crime is down, New York has to find creative ways to stay dangerous. But I know the real explanation for these deaths. There is one for those who are willing to listen. The answer lies in the landscape itself. The, sky, the Manhattan skyline has changed since I moved here from Cincinnati at the age of 18. What no one seems willing to mention is that before the World Trade Center fell, lightning rarely struck any parts of Manhattan other than the towers themselves, as they were the highest conductors in the city. But they are gone, and now we have taken their place, little conductors in our tight jeans and unwashed t-shirts, as easy targets in a city that was supposed to hide us. Tonight I poured whiskey into two glass tumblers and watched snow fall across the television screen. Outside taxis sped south toward the bridges, and Della and I kissed on the bed as close as we could to the air conditioning. Her tongue was dry and her neck heavy, our faces blue in the television light. After she smoked her last cigarette, we took our clothes off. We did not have sex. We were nervous, and Del was tired. Get the lights, will you? She said as she reached over and set the alarm clock for 8 a.m. I thought the final moments of our single lives must turn, might turn us into feral sex partners, but we stuck to our routine. Tomorrow morning we are getting married at City Hall. I wish I could say that I am marrying Delphine Kusavos, a beautiful Greek woman with long black hair and a bad smoking habit, only out of love. That we bumped into each other on 7th Street near Tompkins Square Park eight months ago and clinging to each other's arms and sentences. They're about to spend $30 for, on a two-minute ceremony. That also isn't the correct explanation of events. 
It's just the easiest story to tell. Many of us came to New York to get away from the stories of our childhoods, hoping here they would no longer apply. For a long time, I thought I could shake the predictions told to me about my family, the ones my mother raised me on in a darkened house in Cincinnati that took each death as evidence, each year as a clue. There is a pattern that runs through the generations, a conspiracy in the bloodstream that kills with perfect timing. For many years, I thought, I thought nothing from back there could find me. The stories could be wrong, but they could also be devastatingly correct. If I'm right, I won't live to see our first anniversary. For a while, I was very young here and didn't need to give in to the paranoia. I remember a lot of first days in the city, how a morning could lead to a fist fight with a homeless woman, a request by a model scout on Broadway to come into the agency for pictures, an offer of a part-time job cater waiting for a group of Chinese diplomats, or a four milligram clonopin shared with a failed child actor hiding from Hollywood, before riding bicycles around an empty loft in Tribeca until our minds became unglued at dawn. All of those first shiny details told us that we had gotten very far from where we started, and there was good reason to expect more. We still go under rooftops. We still look at the storms dragging in from the west. At some point, we stop thinking of our time here as an open story that would only end well. Lightning doesn't strike the same place twice until it does. Behind every senseless tragedy, there is a careful logic. At some point, the weather changed when no one was looking. And we were no longer so young in New York. Well, if someone listening hasn't heard about Lightning People yet, can you describe the novel? Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a, um, well, I tried not to write a, a, a New York City novel, but that's exactly what it is in the end. Um, it's a novel that takes place in the summer of 2007, and it follows uh, uh, a group of, uh, of people, uh, not so young anymore, not so old either, uh, in Manhattan, as their lives kind of fall apart um, due to various forces, uh, external and internal. Um, so... That's a that's a rather vague uh, description, but uh, <laughs> I guess it kind of deals with the 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 the, the, the craziness of the city and also all of the paranoia of the time um, that they're living in. Sure, sure. Well, I noticed in your bio that you grew up in Ohio, and as I was reading Lightning People, as someone who lived in New York for nine years and still loves the city. Um, I felt like the the novel had a definite feel and tone of someone writing about New York with a love for the city as someone who isn't a native New Yorker. And and I just wondered, did you write um, did you write about New York and the city specifically, kind of out of your own experience and and along those lines? What has been your experience of New York? I know had had you ever visited the city before you moved there to attend? Col- yeah, uh, I had a. I had a. I was lucky. I, I grew up in Cincinnati, and um, and I loved Cincinnati. But I, uh, I was lucky to have an aunt and uncle who lived in Manhattan uh, when I was a kid, and I would come up for summers, and uh, you know, I was in I was in the suburbs, so I was amazed as a as a kid to to see New York and just to see all the uh, insanity. I was a, you know the the exoticness of the subway. You know, really astounded me. I remember when I was a, a little kid. So I, I was always dreaming of New York and. I think it's funny because I think when you're from somewhere else and you're always thinking of a place, uh, it becomes very <laughs> mythical to you. And then when you live there, um, it becomes very real. But I don't think it loses some of the, those myths from when you're a kid. So I think in writing about New York, you're kind of writing about your own experience. Um, and I definitely some of that uh, influenced what happens in the book. And also, it's kind of the great big mythical city, dream city, that you, you still kind of hold on to from your, uh, from your childhood days, not growing up there. Sure. Um, Do you ever feel, I mean, have you thought about it? Do you ever feel that people who move to New York as, as um, young adults or, you know, in their 20s after college have an even greater love for the city than native New Yorkers who kind of take it for granted? Yes. I, well, I mean, I don't, you know, if, if, if those listening are, are from native New Yorkers, they'll probably be writing angry emails. But I, uh, <laughs> I, but I do think, I think, I think there's a reason that, that everyone, the character in the book, um, there are immigrants who come here in the, the one of the main characters, Del, she comes, uh, 
from Greece to go to college in, in Columbia. And basically part of the plot of the book is her trying to stay in New York and get it and keep a visa. Um, and of course the, the beginning of the, the book, she, she's going to city hall to get married is, you know, convincing herself, maybe it's out of love, but really it's to try to stay in the city. And then there are, are immigrants who are, you, are, are kind of coming to New York, uh, exiled from their homelands in the Midwest and South. So I think that it's still an immigrant city, even if you, uh, don't come, uh, from a different country. I felt like that, you know, you kind of come here, uh, you run to New York, look to kind of escape your, your old life and, 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 and start over from scratch. And, um, that makes, you know, that makes New York a very special place and very valuable to people because, uh, when you, you know, you're remaking your identity and you, you, it's a big choice to pick that city. Uh, so of course people are going to feel very strongly about it. Um, and then I think I wrote about New York because, it was impossible, I think, for my, for for me to avoid in terms of my imagination and where I wanted to set so many characters. I certainly couldn't have. I mean, you know, there are great books to be written about Cincinnati for sure, but I certainly couldn't have written about the wide uh, range of characters and set them there sure. in any realistic way. You know, right. so. Um, but I think also, I, I'm going to be honest. I, I kind of I enjoyed writing uh, Lightning People because it gave me an opportunity to investigate a side of New York that I don't think is very often told in novels or film or, or media. I think that, uh, ironically, in the last decade, New York has been seen as this sort of uh, never-ending uh, shopping excursion and blind date hub. You know, I think a lot of the, sure. there's, this, there's this idea that it's this sort of like fun playground that, that where there's no kind of... Uh, responsibility and there are no consequences. And I didn't experience that so much. You know, I mean, New York is very much fun, but it sure. also is a very still dark, gritty, ruthless, tough place to live. So that's the, the New York I was more interested in uh, in bringing out. Sure. Well, one of the but central... as a kid, I romanticized that that side of New York. So you know, maybe it's also a very romantic idea of it. It's just a bit of a, a tougher one. Sure, sure. Well, one of the central characters of the novel becomes obsessed with conspiracy theories in post nine eleven New York. Um, most New Yorkers or people who were in New York City on nine eleven have have coped in a variety of ways. Some people try to pretend that it never happened and. I'm just curious, do you remember how you got the idea for Joseph to become infatuated with conspiracy theories? Yeah, I, um, well, I had always, I mean, conspiracy theories are not something that I, I, I really trust or believe in or hold much stock in, but I am fascinated with their existence and people's uh, proclivity to, to hold on to them so tightly. And it's basically just a, a complete uh, distrust of the world around you or what's being told and i think that uh well i had uh, i'd come from catholic uh democrat family so i was always obsessed from an early age i was raised on uh on the kennedy assassination so i think i did have a little bit of a natural interest in the subject just from that it was not a weird question to around my household or my neighborhood when i was a kid to think who killed kennedy really you know which is already uh, doubting the government answer. But sure. um, I, I was interested in, the, in that because exactly what you're saying, it was, um, it was a response to 9-11. I think people felt very wounded and victimized and shocked, and they didn't feel like they were, they were being provided with any information or the right information, and then that sort of spins out of control, and people come up with all sorts of, you know, various levels of rational to completely irrational theories about it. And I thought that was just such an interesting, uh, bizarre subset of the population. Um, but I actually don't think, I think that maybe the, the conspiracy theory meetings I mentioned, they really kind of go all the way and, 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 and come up with these crazy plots. But, you know, it's like I was getting a haircut and the other month and someone was saying that, you know, the tsunami might have been caused by an oil. It, it just, you know, these barbers are talking. I think actually it's in the language of America to, to kind of develop conspiracy theories. Right. Um, and I think that might be because it's, a, it's, you know, a democracy, so it's run by the people. And that just means that I think people very, very, have very serious doubts about each other. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, you it, know. It, so it, I, I mean, not to go off on too much of a tangent about nine eleven, but <clears throat> and and not to talk about conspiracy theories specifically, but I think it, I think it's kind of interesting as someone who was in the city on 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 that day that mm-hmm. I, I think that most Americans still don't fully realize the the impact. I think that, and, and this is just obviously my own opinion. I think that a lot of times people just kind of file it away in their head as, as, as something that happened on a TV screen. And, and the reason I say that is, um, I, I hate to admit, but I found myself at this latest Transformers movies this, this past uh, summer. And there are scenes in there where there are skyscrapers, you know, just being thrown about and, and people mm-hmm. in, and people inside of them. And, and I was physically uncomfortable in the, in the theater. And when I left, I was just like, wow, like did do people in LA really don't grasp it? It's just interesting. I, I, I don't know. I don't really have a question around that. It was just more of a something it's a, that it's a, yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a crazy experience. And in a way, I think that the, uh, the uh, obsession with watching the, I mean, now I think it's, it's, it's maybe that that's been digested a little bit, but in the, the days and months and years after nine eleven, I think the obsessive watching of the, the buildings fall on YouTube or on television. Right. And it just, and part of me thinks that was an attempt to maybe dull the impact of it by watching it over. And it also, I mean, I think for conspiracy theorists, it, it entered the brain and they would watch it and then look for, you know, things that were to be faulted or it was just a sort of a way, a dealing mechanism. Yeah. But I think yeah. when you watch something that many times, it does take on a different, uh, becomes almost part of TV and very fictional and yeah yeah and people and, don't realize and, yeah. and and I think it's so close to the surface I think that most people it's, it's almost kind of like um, I, I think that when 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 sociologists and pop culture theorists look back they're going to say oh yeah of course there were there were movies 10 years later with with uh, with uh, um, buildings flying around that you know it was their their cultural way of, of dealing with it the same way you know people have have talked about Godzilla after you know the the uh, the bombings in Japan during World War II. Yeah, I mean, I also think that you spend. I mean, the the society has turned us into such media people that you you know when you build a whole nation of of media obsessed, uh, you know, fantasy living dwelling people you you can't expect them to step out of it when something real and awful happens of course they're going to react still living half in kind of a mediated you know universe sure sure so well well to shift gears a little bit as someone who who works in the media industry in new york do you spend much time thinking about the changes in book publishing going on right now for for many years, lot long before ebooks ever took off, people were saying that book publishing was pretty much doomed. But now, however, the the industry truly is undergoing huge kind of mo- mo- uh, momentous changes in a very short amount of time. And I was just curious: do you ever think about the future of book publishing? Yeah, I mean, I worked I worked in magazines for 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 the past. Uh... Ten years, and so I mean, in that time, I, I can see magazines have changed. So many of them have folded. Um, it's hard to get advertising. The very structure has changed. I, and I know for book publishing, it's it's very similar. I think when you know when you find out that uh, so many people on an airplane are reading the Kindle, maybe it isn't as romantic as you think a, a hardback book was, but at least it's encouraging that people are still reading. Sure. Um, I think, you know, it's always, I think, been a little, the publishing industry always, of course, is very, very doom and gloom about their own existence and that they're, they're underappreciated in a lot of ways. Um, I'm very optimistic that there will always be books and there will always be great writers. Um, and if anything, the, the internet provides more opportunity for different kind of writers to find their audience, I suppose. But, um, but I think it, it is so frightening if it becomes, to me, with the, the nice thing about a book, unlike a magazine, um, is that it's sort of a free zone from advertising and you know all these attempt, uh, attempts to grab your attention and sell products. And sure. I'm sure that will change drastically. Um, I'm sure in the future we can expect to read Mark Twain and a Target ad will pop up halfway <laughs> through, <laughs> which, which yeah. I'm sure is not what he would have liked. But, yeah. Um, yeah. 
but yeah, I, but I'm still, I'm still optimistic. I think it's, it's, it's definitely more, it's a ruthless place and it's very hard to get to work in and, uh, and find a job and, and, and find success. I guess, um, you know, but I think writers tend to be, as much as they don't like to admit it, diehard romantics. So they don't like change. Right. They don't like technology and they don't want, you know, they don't want to, they wanted to keep it into that kind of beautiful dream idea of, you know, martini lunches and going to write and you have a publisher and an agent. And it's, a, it's a nice idea, but yeah, it's, it's definitely corroding. Yeah. Um, Who are some of the writers that inspire you and that you enjoy reading when you're not writing? Oh, I'm a, a big fan of uh, obviously Joan Didion was a, is a, is a big influence to me. It's actually I thought when I started writing uh, the, my first novel that I was going to write in a much uh, colder fashion, but it turns out that I didn't. Uh, that wasn't a style that uh, was useful to me at all. I couldn't. It wasn't my my style. So uh, Norman Mailer was a was a big influence. Uh, Salman Rushdie. I, I really loved uh, his early books. What's funny is I was um, I worked at a, a very small magazine when I started, uh, and I was about 24, 25, and I was already sort of the features editor of this magazine. And I got an opportunity to interview my sort of my first interviews was to interview Joan Didion and Norman Mailer and these heavyweights that I had been uh, you know obsessed with since high school and college. I was an English major, just to you know I loved them, and then I was suddenly interviewing them as my first, you know, attempts to, to be a journalist. Um, in some ways, I think that's a terrible thing to do is to meet your heroes right away. <laughs> because, because there's nowhere to go from that, you know? You have such big expectations. Um, but, uh, but it was also a real thrill. Um, did you, did you find it hard it, to work on your own stuff after you interviewed Mailer or Joan Didion? Well, that's what, that's what I mean. I actually think there's a certain point when you have to, and that's the problem with, with the magazine I work at Interview, and it's a problem because you're always interviewing other people. And there's a certain moment as a writer where you need to pack it up and just say, okay, they're great. I love them, but I'm not going to be the fan. You know, I want to be my own voice, my own man. I want to be my own writer now. So, sure. yeah, you've got to get past that. You've got to, I mean, I don't think you need to kill your heroes, but you definitely need to uh, put a pillow over them and, and, and let them... <laughs> You know, hide them when you're writing a so, little bit. So, so when you started writing in magazines, did you know all along that you wanted to be a fiction writer? And were you working on things then? I had wanted to be a fiction writer since I was uh, about eight eight years old. And the reason, the the, per, the author I have to blame for that is actually Agatha Christie. Because she, I had became obsessed with Agatha Christie at age eight. And I read all of the books and I wanted to be... I basically wanted to be a private investigator, but I realized that there, that's really not uh, a very, uh, you know, there's not a lot of big demand for right. people uh, investigating things on, on, in man, old mansions. So I, a writer seemed the next best uh, job for me. And so, yeah, I wanted to do that. In fact, magazines was, was just an opportunity to uh, get my foot in the door with writing professionally. I didn't uh, kind of seg from magazines to wanting to write fiction. It was kind of fiction was always in the back of my mind, and magazines was just what was available for me right. to do. Um, that said, I didn't really write after college. I really didn't write much in my twenties. I I always regret that now, but I uh, I don't think I was ready to yet. I had started a few things, but I couldn't ever seem to make it work. Right, and maybe I just didn't have the experience and maturity yet to to tackle a character for, you know, hundreds of pages. Sure. So I didn't start lightning people until age 30. And, uh, in fact, right when I turned 30, I thought, uh, I'm going to be saying I want to write a novel at age 80 if I don't start right now. Right. And so I really just forced myself, you know, against my <laughs> will and my interest in going outside to, uh, to sit down and do it. Gotcha. And what was the process like for you of, of writing it and, and then and then finding a publisher? Well, I uh, I had written about a hundred pages of it, and um, I I didn't really know what to do. I was very I some people let their let friends and mentors read as they're going. Mm -hmm. I couldn't do that. I felt if I had gotten any negative criticism from someone that I trusted. 
I would have stopped writing. Right. So I kind of just, I prevented that from happening. I don't even think it's a good idea. I don't recommend it. I think you should just write on your own and, you know, keep going and let it flow and don't listen to what people say on that first kind of rush of writing. And so after 100 pages, I uh, had a friend who uh, had an agent at William Morris and connected me to an agent there who is, who is my agent now. And I finally kind of sent 40 pages. He liked them. We had lunch. It felt like a really good relationship. And he was really instrumental uh, in bringing around and bringing about the book and was very involved in the, the actual plumbing of it. I mean, when I took false turns and I took many false turns in writing it, Mm -hmm. he kind of, he kind of told me, he didn't tell me what to do, but he's like, this is, you know, falling way outside of, uh, of, of reality, or this is, you know, it's coming across weird. I really listened to him and went mm-hmm. back. Um, I didn't write from an outline. Uh, I didn't, uh, I, 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 I kind of had a sense of where things were going and, you know, there's a lot of twists and turns in the book. There's some murders and, um, you know, kind of, I hope, hopefully it turns into something of a thriller and a page turner. That was, that was my hope halfway through, which is kind of an unexpected turn. But, um, I didn't know exactly what was going to happen because I thought if I did, I would already be prejudiced against the characters while I was writing them or making them. So I kind of let my, uh, I kind of let go of, of trying to kind of solve the mystery, uh, from the outset. Right. Um, which was, I think, which is very helpful for me. Um, when you, when you talk to aspiring writers, what, what kind of advice do you offer them for, to to pursue their own writing and publication? Uh, well, you know, what's funny is I was recently reading, somehow I, you know, in some way I was, I was, I was reading Elmore Leonard had put out 10 rules for writing and two of them, <clears throat> his big two, his first two, I think, I actually uh, don't follow in my, in, if you read the first line of the book. He says, don't start open a book starting about the weather, <laughs> which is my first line is about the weather. And, uh, and, and the second one, he says, don't start with a prologue. It's boring. And so right under that, uh, right above that first line of the weather is my prologue. Right. So, you know what? Like, he's wrong. He's absolutely wrong. And uh, he means well, and everyone has their own rules. I think it's really bad to listen to these older writers tell you how to do it. Um, but I think the best advice one can give is, uh, is that it's don't wait for inspiration. I mean, I, I didn't want, I think even bad writing, you stay with what you're doing and you stay close to the characters. I think you just have to be disciplined to sit down every day and commit three hours to it. Um, three or four hours every day, whether you're in the mood or not, because right. you're never going to be in the mood. So, uh, you know, it's a, it's a tough, it's a tough road to write a book, I think. And I think you just have to be determined to do it and to really realize that it's like one, one, even one pass of, of a book, um, you're going to go back and rewrite and rewrite and rewrite. So just dedication is, is the best advice I, I can give anyone. Sure. Are you working on another novel now? What are you working on? I am. I just started it. I was terrified for some reason to, to start it again. Um, and I just did, I followed that rule. I just said, okay, stop, just sit down. And start writing. I'm going to try to. I'm actually going to try to write a, a murder mystery um, for this one. The, the last one was kind of a murder mystery in reverse because you knew who the killer was, but you didn't know how they were going to get away with it or not. But this one uh, is. I wanted to have some a bit of mystery. I thought it would be really kind of fun, fun to write. I still don't know. This time, I actually think I do need to solve uh, <laughs> solve solve the mystery a little bit ahead of time. But uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm, so that's what I'm working on, um, and I'm doing it, you know, every day, just a, an hour or two, uh, to get going. Great. Well, where can people find uh, find you online? Oh, well, I have a website, uh, ChristopherBullen uh, dot com, actually, and it has some of those interviews I was talking about um, that I did when I was younger with those uh, great authors on there, and. Um, yeah, and then I, I, you know, I hope people, I hope people, I, you know, it's funny, you put a book out into the world and it receives some attention, you get very excited, and then you kind of have to, like a child, let it go and hope that it finds uh, some other people in the world that like it, and then you just kind of have to start the next one. So, right. I, you know, I'm hopeful that Lightning people will uh, will find some, some fans, and I hope that I can 
uh, start off on good spirits on this next one. Great. Well, again, we've been speaking with Christopher Bolin, author of Lightning People, available in bookstores now. Chris, thanks for doing the interview. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Hi, this is author Peter O'Rulian, uh, author of The Unremembered, and you're listening to the Reading and Writing Podcast. Thanks for listening to my latest podcast. If you have a chance, please leave a review of the podcast in iTunes. It only takes a moment. Until next time, read some good books and be well. We did it again. Verizon was just named America's most reliable network by Root Metrics for the 16th time in a row, proving once again that nobody builds networks like Verizon builds networks. That's why we're building 5G right. That's why there's only one best network. Verizon. Best and most reliable based on root metrics reports from second half 2013 to first half 2021 of three operators on all network types combined. Not specific to 5G networks. In South Dakota, we're looking forward to exploring new roads and wide open spaces. When you're ready to travel, go great places. Learn more at TravelSouthDakota.com.